uh, Marco Pirabel from the OpenBSD project, uh, doing his talk on epitome and data deduplication. Uh, so, let's kick off. First, let me um, let me do some definitions because there's going to be a lot of buzzwords uh, floating around. The industry is uh, they are all over this. This is the latest and greatest new thing, and we're going to sell a billion of them, according to all the vendors. So, <clears throat> first of all, let me um, let me try to do some definitions here of, of what we will be talking about. So, first of all, the the epitome suite is um, is a mechanism and it's a protocol to provide data deduplication. So data deduplication is defined as the elimination of redundant data. So the point of that is obviously when you make a whole bunch of backups, it would be kind of nice if you could just get rid of all the duplicate um, data that you have. It's, it's pretty uh, obvious when you run a Towers of Anoy backup scheme that you'll be backing up the same thing over and over and over again. So that's bad for obvious reasons, but we'll get into uh, more of those details. Um, the cool thing about Epitome is that we are actually going to be able to address uh, three different technologies that, that are out there in the, in, the, in the storage world right now, they're doing the rounds, and they're selling them for, for absolutely exorbitant amounts of money. So the first one we'll talk about a little bit is CAS, or Content Addressable Storage. Then we'll talk a little bit about the SIS, Single Instance Storage, and then we'll go into the dedupe stuff. So first of all, I uh, want to... Uh, Thank Plan 9 for uh, giving me some really, really good ideas. Didn't uh, use their code, but um, I definitely did use some of their uh, research that, that they put into, uh, into the Venti file system, which is really cool. So I wanted to make sure that you guys saw that. So first of all, let's, uh, let's go plug through all these buzzwords. First of all, let's talk about cache, or content addressable storage. So the idea behind this is that you have a, a usually a large file and you want to associate it with something. So a good example is it's actually happening in the medical industry. So the medical industry, what they do, they have, um, they have, for example, these huge files uh, of an x-ray, for example. So they take an x-ray of your leg, and they want to basically associate um, that picture with a patient. So what they do is basically they, they stream this file um, to, a, uh, to a CAS system, which will return to them a, um, a UUID so a unique identifier, so they can retrieve the, the file later. So in other words, you can literally say, uh, based on this file, I generate this UUID, and next time you give me that UUID, you will be able to retrieve the data that you put into the system. So that's obviously um, pretty handy to do certain things. So uh, the other main area this is being used for is for regulatory stuff. So uh, our government loves this stuff. Because you write this stuff to warm, uh, you can't change it ever again. Uh, in it's, it's all over the place. So they use it for uh, high pass socks. There's some other um, regulatory things that they use it for. So a, um, an example of how CAS would work is so you have an application. You generate a file so you, with some content, for example, that x-ray uh, that I was talking about. And at one point, that application says, you know what, I want to start archiving this data. So you archive the file, you, send it to, you would send it to the epitome, and the epitome will return you a hash. And that hash is basically your UUID, the thing you can uh, use to, um, to retrieve the data with. Uh, and then the application is also uh, required to obviously store the association, right? Because it's, it's the only one who knows that that file belongs to whatever it is it tries to associate it with. Let's talk a little bit about SIS. So SIS, um, by the way, the industry is not really set on all these definitions, but I picked ones that I think were most prevalent for these buzzwords. Uh, so SIS is a, um, is a variation of this. Um, this is basically, th this is easiest to explain with an, uh, with an example like I have right here up on the board. So let's say you send an email to a thousand people. Um, the email body is obviously the same for the thousand people that receive it. So it would be ideal if you would only have to save it once, right? And then you save the, the headers uh, separately. And that's basically the idea. So you save a single piece of data only once. Never go beyond doing that. Obviously, doing the CAS and the SIS method will require application uh, support because the application need to understand the protocol. So dedo, which is basically what it, what this, um, what Epitome actually does. 
So VDoop is basically um, nothing else than a, a streamer that basically retrieves a file, chunks it up in a, um, in a variable or fixed sizes, and for all of those sizes that it, that it retrieves, it will basically generate a hash. Um, and then it, it validates if the hash exists or not. If it doesn't exist, obviously it needs to be saved off, so it saves it off to a backend. If it does exist, then it knows it doesn't need to save it again, so it won't. So let's talk about the reason for deduping. So like I alluded to earlier, so the, the towers of analyze schemes are uh, pretty wasteful. So for example, if you have a backup window of let's say eight hours and you need to back up 10 terabytes of data, and you need to tra uh, transport 10 terabytes of data to, uh, to your tape device or uh, over the network that obviously will use up a bunch of uh, resources. So if you are able to, um, before you actually send anything over the network, if you are able to determine if the data already exists, you can basically skip that. And in other words, you would basically sit there, chunk the data, and compare the hashes against the uh, over networks. So instead of sending terabytes of data over the wire, you'll send bytes over the over the network. So, um, so one of the problems that is really starting to become pretty severe in, in the industry right now is that the sizes of backups are, are pretty much out of control. Right? You, there's no more tape you can throw at this to, um, to keep it going. So different schemes need to be uh, devised. Um, so there's some good things, obviously, about backing up the disk. Right? You're, you don't have a seek time. You don't have to sit there waiting for a tape to rewind or forward wind or do the other great things that it does. Right? Miss a beacon, rewind again, and, and basically uh, do some shoe shining. Um, so disks are obviously becoming increasingly cheap. Right? You can now buy a 1.5 terabyte disk for $200, two dollars $300. So it's, uh, tapes are really going away, this time for real. I mean, I've heard that song a couple of times, but, um, but the indications are now that, uh, that tapes are really going to go away. <coughs> also, tapes are really unreliable over the long term. That's not what the tape vendors want you to hear, but it's true, right? Go find yourself a backup from two or three years ago and try to, uh, try to put it back on, uh, on something that works. All righty, so who else is playing? So I have not found anything else in the open source minus Venti and uh, Epitome that actually does some of this stuff. Um, so there's some, uh, some vendors out there that, do, that have some pretty interesting uh, solutions for it. So data domain, quantum, so some of those folks actually have some pretty elaborate DDoop schemes. But um, don't, don't be surprised if you're paying $50,000 just to get one of their appliances that does some of the stuff that, uh, that Epitome does. Um, so I haven't talked about the algorithm yet, but, um, but the epitome algorithm is as simple as, a, as, as it gets. It literally will just read a file, uh, run a SHA on it on, on fixed size, uh, and, that's your, and that's your ID. So you can always recreate the same ID. Um, these vendors, they, they have some, uh, some mathematicians working on some of the really cool stuff. So they have beacon detection, right? So if you insert a single byte into your stream, right, in epitome, you would basically re dedupe the whole new f the whole file. So but what, what they did, basically, they said, oh, you know what, there's an offset of one, so if we just save that one by, uh, separate by itself, and then the rest of the file remains the same. So they do some pretty clever things there. But again, you're, uh, you're paying for it. <clears throat> so this is one of the fine things that I um, lifted out of the research that the Venti folks did at Plan 9. Um, so they, they use also a SHA-1, 160-bit, and uh, so I did some math on it. Um, as you can see, with 80 million hashes at 16 kilobytes, which would yield about 12.2 terabytes worth of data, there's a 2.18 to the minus 31st uh, chance of hash collision. So it's it's pretty minimal. So uh, in other words, I'm not too worried about it. That's a pretty small number. Um, so, but obviously there is there is a possibility of. Um, of having some hash collisions. So in the future, I will make that a user settable, uh, to a user settable value. So you could pick a SHA-256, uh, for example, or whichever one. So another thing that's actually pretty simple to add, uh, and I'm really strongly considering doing that uh, for the next release, is just doing the size detection, right? So if, if we have a SHA with a size associated with it, it's pretty much the, the chance of that ever being the same uh, is, is basically zero. So that would be a, a very cheap way uh, of, of finding uh, collisions. Uh, 
All right, so this is the currently implemented architecture that exists. Um, let me uh, walk through the steps right here. So for example, this is actually what I have on my laptop. Um, what it has, it has several backends, so you can choose your, uh, your type of backend. So the, um, the file one was the first one that I wrote. That one was basically more a, uh, a test. So basically what it does is it writes all the SHAs out to the file, and the file name is actually the SHA it's associated with. So basically uh, it's very easy to, to seek uh, within the directory and find the, the appropriate uh, data that goes with that. Um, it saves the metadata locally. So that is good and bad, but it, what it does provide with the metadata is you have a snapshot of whatever it is that you made a backup of. And if you change a file, for example, uh, and then run the backup again, your metadata is going to be identical to the same size, right? Because the files, the amount of files that you change. But uh, it will have a different uh, hash somewhere in there that will tell you which uh, portions did change. And you'll, you'll see, I got a few examples, and you'll see uh, what the savings are if you make a very simple change. So, but the way it works is it epitomizes the tool that basically, it's, it's a tar-like tool. It takes pretty much the same flags, uh, and it runs a, a backup basically, just like tar would. Uh, and then instead of getting a tar file, you get a, a metadata file. So it goes through the uh, library that I wrote, uh, that basically does all the junking and all the, all the hard work. And then it goes off to a backend. So the backend is a pluggable unit, so you can, it's basically a, a driver, if you will. So you can have different ones. And, and I wrote three of them at this point. And uh, I will add some more. All right, this describes the tools that are currently implemented. So before you ex are actually able to use the system, you need to, uh, you need to prepare it. And um, it just depends on the back end what the amount of work is that needs to be done. So for example, with the file backends, you need to create all the directories where the, um, where the files go into. And the way I did it um, to make to the directories not too large, uh, the first two digits of the hash are all directories. So you have zero through FF. Um, in the, um, the, the, that basically it creates those 255 directories. So in the raw backend, it basically the raw basically goes directly to, to disk. So what it does is it writes a marker on the front of the disk and what tells you where, where we're at. Right, so whenever you add more data, you just keep on streaming it until the disk fills up. Um, <coughs> so Epitool, that is a um, um, sort of like a little toolbox that has utilities like LS and DU uh, so that you know how much of your raw disk you've used. So an epitomize is, is the tar-like utility that, was, uh, that I was talking about. So here's the, um, the flow of epitomize at this point. So currently, when um, you open up basically a file, he recurs through the directories, but you open up a file, uh, you read uh, a chunk, whatever the size that is. So if you set it to 16K, it will read 16K of that file. It will calculate the hash over that. If it exists, then so it, uh, it basically asks the bank, hey, does this exist? And if the answer is yes, then you're done. So you move on to the next chunk. If it's <coughs> not done, you compress the data, because um, you do want to obviously save disk space. So, and if the data doesn't become any smaller, you don't, you don't save it uh, compressed. If it does become smaller, you save it compressed, so that you can, uh, again, save some additional uh, bytes. So the um, one thing I want to touch on is that I use the regex instead of uh, glob, and that was just uh, a personal preference. Um, one thing I want to touch on as well is that the metadata is saved locally. So, and it's pretty neat. So, um, you could basically create a a database with all your hashed, uh, so sorry, with all your metadata, you could actually create, and these are, like I said earlier, it's basically a snapshot, snapshot of your data. So you can actually look at, uh, go back and forth uh, between versions of, of files. Here's an example of uh, epitomize in, uh, in action. So um, for the folks that use star, that should be pretty familiar. Uh, so the, the flags are essentially the same. I tried to keep them as much uh, the same as, as possible. So what I did in this particular case, I backed up the kernel directory for OpenBSD. So I read a whole bunch of stuff. The portions that got compressed, so it's, it's a bit hard to figure out how this works, but um, these are the compressed data that was saved was that size. These are the amount of SHAs that were generated. So in the amount of unique SHAs, were, so if you look at the numbers, the difference, 
It's only 1% difference in the first run, right? So there was not too much uh, deduplication going on uh, the first run. Um, so it shows you the, the, how much dedupe data was saved, compressed, uh, in a total written size. So overall, between dedupe and compression, we achieved a 69% uh, compression ratio, or overall reduction ratio. So I ran exactly the same backup right after that, and I generated, obviously, a new uh, metadata file. And as we can see right now, we basically saved nothing to the back end. So at this point, you would basically achieve a 100% reduction uh, on your backup. But this obviously, I'm cheating, because I did this 30 seconds right after the, uh, the first one. But I just wanted to underscore uh, the methodology. <coughs> <clears throat> so, and, in, uh, and as an example, what I did is actually I edited uh, Syscon generic, and uh, I enabled, uh, was it the experimental AOE support, and then I ran the backup again. And as you can see, pretty much everything is the same again, right? So, the same numbers, but we achieved this time a 99%. Uh, yes, sir? Um, your first line, first backup, the initial backup, uh -huh. the savings, are those um, savings in chunks? Yes, Which? both. So since since you are shying, uh, you get them both for free, basically. Right. So so if, if you have two files that have a different file name but have the same content, they're going to chunk. So they're going to generate the same shot. So you can throw away duplicate files that way. Um, if you have actually duplicate areas within different files, you would also find those collisions and obviously throw those out. So and on top of that, you obviously also have the compression that's run on the block size or the chunk size. So, but in, in, in this example, uh, obviously I only changed a couple of bytes, so that's not that uh, interesting. But again, you, you can see how this would generate sort of like a movie of your files. Uh, so the, I wanted to show you guys how big it is. So the, uh, the metadata files were about 1.2 megs after I created them. And then I just um, go through some commands just to, under, to show you how that would work. So I created a few temporary directories, and I uh, uncompress uh, the same file that I changed earlier. So then I run a diff on it, and that was basically the change that I made. So you can see, again, the, the snapshotting action. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the protocol. So the protocol is, is extremely simple. Um, the folks who know me know that I don't like to write complex code because I want to be able to read it afterwards. So I like to keep things all very, very small and uh, not so clever. Um, so to be able to do all the stuff that I did, you can do it with these, uh, these primitives. So open, close, create, exists, read, and write. So open is uh, when you open up your backend so that you can uh, obviously communicate with it. Uh, close closes all the connections and all the in, frees up all the resources that uh, that you created or that you used. Create is basically the prepare part, so that basically creates the uh, the backend or prepares it for first use. Exists uh, basically goes to the backend and asks, "Hey, do you already have the SHA?" And if the answer is yes, then uh, say yes. If the answer is no, say no. Right? It's pretty simple. Then you have a read and write. So the read is simple as, as well. You basically give it a SHA and uh, it will return that data if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it obviously returns failure. Uh, write is about the same thing. So you send it the data, you get back a SHA. So um, I did write some slides on, the, uh, uh, on what can fail and how the, the protocol would work. Hold on, I'll plug through these ones pretty quick. So open verifies that the uh, backend has been prepared, right, so that uh, you actually have a valid backend. Um, so the open connections, it, it allocates all the resources you might need for a session. Um, so open will fail if uh, you don't have a prepared backend, obviously, uh, in, or you run out of resources. So close performs the opposite, obviously. That's pretty simple stuff. So create, like I said, is a um, it's actually um, equivalent to newFS. It's destructive, right? It will destroy everything you already have created in there. So you only should use it, obviously, when you're preparing the backend for first use. And it can fail for obvious reasons of resources or uh, the database already created, something along those lines. 
So exists. So test if the shy exists and return true or false. The read, I already went through that. So um, it reads the data and it has some, um, it has basically a compressed flag with it. So if, it's, um, if it is compressed, it uncompresses the data before it sends it upwards. And the write does the opposite of that. So you send it uh, the data and it will compress the data and save it if it's compressed and, or not save it compressed if it's not, it doesn't get any smaller. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, about um, roadmap stuff. So this does not exist yet. This is the, um, the portion of code that I'm working on right now. So the next thing that I want to generate here is that um, we get a network protocol so that we can basically have a server that sits out in the world somewhere and your clients can basically uh, write directly to it. And, um, and it will return to you metadata or a UUID. So, like I said, I'm going to add a network protocol, add some additional backends. We're going to use PSQL and MySQL as backends. Those are uh, a pretty, um, uh, people like them, so, and they're pretty fast. PSQL is a, is a fine piece of software. Um, what I need, though, is that I need to go write this in a, Ted needs to go write me a, a B plus three implementation. <laughs> So right now I'm using the, the Libc BDB, and the folks who have used it before know it's not very good. So uh, I, I need a, a B plus three. Ted, get to work. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. You can do a paper on it. <laughs> so um, currently the, uh, the raw backend uh, does wait. Sorry. Sorry. Hey, um, so the, the metadata itself is not stored with the chunks? The metadata is not stored with the chunks. Uh, in Epitome 1.0, it, the metadata is returned to the to the user. Okay. So you're the one you're responsible to, for keeping it. So you, you couldn't would, you couldn't pipe it over SSH to another system. You could. could I you mean, you could obviously use magic to do the things you could normally do with a Unix box. Okay. So, but uh, in 2.0, I will I want to be able to actually save the metadata in the backend as well, so that you have a single UUID that will retrieve uh, a whole backup. Does that make sense? And, and by the way, you're effectively enabling uh, the whole cast thing at this point. Yes, sir. Is your network protocol streaming, or is it locked down? Um, well, I wrote about five different versions at this point, and I hit a lock step. I did RPC. I wrote my my own thing, and um, all the lock step ones were, were were crap. So they were just way too slow. So something needed to be done. So. Um, I created a much more elaborate mechanism that forks off some processes, and one of them is chunking. The other one is basically uh, doing the, uh, the communication. So one of them is, is pretty uh, I.O. and CPU intensive, and the other one just sits there sending stuff over the network. So and that works a whole lot better. So have you tested this over anything other than local Ethernet? No. All right. it's, it's prototype stuff. So you should probably look at Usenet. I should look at Usenet. What do you mean? Well, because a lot of the interesting things to do with streaming data over lot, like potentially latent slash uh, packet lossy networks was fixed 30 years ago or 20 years ago now, I guess. The idea is, instead of doing lockstep stuff, you send a whole lot of crap, and then you, the, the other end will tell you what what sort of stuff, what, what needs to happen. So instead of you waiting for a red network round trip time for any of your changes to happen. Well, I'm just throwing it out there, because a lot no, of people keep no, no, I hear you. about hard and no, so but there, there's a there's a few complications there, right? So um, the read and write commands are they are a multi uh, process, so they didn't start a multi process, multi step. So the, it's not a just send it out there and you're done with it. No, because if you do a uh, if you do a write, you're going to get a SHA back that you need to do something with. Sure, but not every write is going to not every every write is going to change the entire database. It won't change anything unless no. it doesn't exist. No, what I'm saying is you can run stuff in parallel if you know that they're in different places. Well, I'm just saying that you, you should sit there, probably sit down and look at what you can do to, to mitigate uh, to mitigate issues, introduce, get introduced when you have network latency. Because 99% of the people I've seen working on stuff like this, it's a great idea, and then they make it work on Ethernet, and then anything more than a few milliseconds of latency completely kills through. Absolutely sure. Should to the point where people just build networks with one switch in the middle to bypass, like multi-switch, you know, fractions of a millisecond of latency because high throughput stuff falls to the ground. So I'm, I'm just throwing it out. Okay, no, I appreciate it. 
Um, so, and one of the things that I need to do in um, on, on the raw backend that I'm do right now is uh, I'm still wasting some space. So, when I write, write an uneven uh, block size, so let's say I'm writing out 6K or let's 6,300 bytes, that obviously not going to be fit nicely in 512K, uh, sorry, 512 byte chunks. So, what I want to do is actually read the data from the last block that was written to fill up the remaining uh, few bytes and then write the rest off in, in the other one so that you don't waste any space at all on a disk. So in other words, you could al almost get uh, nearly the whole capacity of the disk with compressed uh, chunks. So um, the Epitome, Epitome 2.0 protocol uh, will obviously make all the commands networkable. Uh, the additions that are going to be added are uh, uh, it's going to be a metadata write and a metadata read. And um, with those two additional commands that will be added, will enable the cache uh, solution. So you basically can write a very large file or a large backup and basically get a single UID to identify whatever it is that you wrote. So the 3.0... Yeah, I, I decided to actually break this up, and again, I'm not very smart, so I need to build this uh, in uh, easy uh, to manage steps. So, um, back to the 2.0, I was wondering, can you after after the client side has received the meta metadata, mm -hmm. can it just submit that? No, so the and, and you yes, because there's going to be a metadata store in the back end as well. Oh yes, but I mean. Uh, if it submitted it normally as a chunk, it would get a Sure, it would get a UID back, right. So that would be, you know, less less good than building it into the protocol, but it would be a way to cheat and get that functionality now. So I, I actually consider that, and uh, the, there's there's some complications. I'm just going to put it that way. So the the way I write the metadata, it's a streaming thing. So it, as, as I do work, uh, it writes additional stuff uh, to that file. So it's not that you could stream that at the same time as you're streaming the data. So you have to create it locally first, and then you would have to transmit it again. So um, there were some folks that are actually using the Epitome 1.0 that are doing just that. right? So they write the data. So the, Sorry, they generate the metadata, and then they store the metadata in the... Um, uh, in the back end, there's a normal uh, dedupe thing, and then retain those US shards that come back. So the problem is right now is if your metadata is 1.2 megs, you're going to get still you know, quite a few uh, shards back, and that needs to become one. That's the big deal here. Anything else? No. All right, 3.0. 3.0 is one that's going to become much more interesting because what I want to do is actually add a file system. So everything remains the same, but I want to basically have a file system that you can write to. So um, I think if we, when the 2.0 stuff is in, that this is, um, that all the complexity actually is going to start to live. And obviously in the, uh, the translation layer, when you're basically uh, taking out the file system part, but also we need to go do some sort of namespace thing. So uh, I haven't thought that through yet, but, uh, so we, but it would be optimal if you have 100 users that are basically sharing all that mount, the same mount point, and, uh, and as they write files to it, they would get deduplicated. So uh, for example, you have uh, Mary sends out an email with a picture of her daughter, right? And she's so adorable, everybody wants to save it on the same server. You would obviously only physically save it once. Right, but you're, so how are you calculating you're calculating hashes based on, say, 16K blocks. So every, right. you only read 16K, and you don't try sliding that across to find matches. No, do not. I'm, right. I'm not clever. So I'm not, saying, I'm, not, I'm not trying to say that. No, no. So the thing is, is that that requires very elaborate algorithms. Oh, I, I understand that. I'm just saying, I'm just wondering about what sort of savings you're seeing at the moment for stuff that's not just entire file differences. Um. Because well, you get always you append only files like log files that mm -hmm. have been rotated would would definitely show up. Sure. But things like one one file per um, one file per mail message at the moment, like sure, wouldn't you wouldn't see like you just wouldn't get any hits unless you have modified your app to go the 16k offsets end of head and had to 16k right. offset put body in file. That's right. Oh look, it gets it, it gets hit. Right. No. So that's um, but like I said, it requires a lot more. Um, Processor overhead a lot, so there's there's some sub algorithms out there that can actually do do beacon detection. Right. Um, 
the like I said, so when you go to a server model, it's not as big a deal as it is when you when you're chunking on the client side. This is why I'm just curious about the motivation for providing an actual file system. So the real motivation is that you get um, you you basically get a uh, your files become movies. As you save your file, you have a version of that file. When you save it the next time, you have the next version of that. So you never lose any data mm -hmm. along the way. So again, for um, when you do working with compliance stuff, so the government could track every single change made to every single file at any given time. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea behind this. Mm -hmm. So th don't expect this to be a high performance file system either, right? But it is. But again, your files are all are movies, um, and you do get the deduplication out of it. Yes, sir. Um, Venti does some of this stuff as well, but Venti does some of this stuff as well. So they have a utility called VAC, which is their equivalent to TAR. Um, the so the code is non-portable. The code that I wrote it's pure Plan Nine stuff. So it's uh, that was one of the reasons why I actually didn't pursue changing that code and in, in, uh, using it. I don't like the license either. That was uh, part of the problem. So they have that weird license with those weird um, uh, things in it. That I'm not a lawyer, so. I'm not going to risk it. All right. So as I was saying, I will. I, will, I want to add a um, a file system uh, mechanism to it. So another thing I want to add is actually some backup agents, so that you could back up a, a Postgres SQL database. So another idea that I'm toying with is um, making it actually a backend for something like Postgres. So you could basically also create at this point, uh, you could save every record change. Right, so every record change would be also logged forever. Again, think compliance. So, uh, like I said earlier, so we need a namespace thing. So I need to figure that out. I just haven't thought it through yet, because we need to. Uh, you need, need to have. It kind of depends on what you want to do, right? So if you want to have, uh, let's say, two work groups, and but you want to physically uh, keep the the namespaces apart, then some magic needs to be done. Right, and I can imagine that, that people would want that, yet they want to keep all the dedupe in the same area, just in case there is some cross pollination and you want to, to save on uh, on saving it or saving the data. As a conclusion, so Epitome is, is very flexible. By the way, that's a difference with uh, with Venti. Venti is, is is set in stone basically. It's uh, they they have some pretty cool algorithms the way they save the data, but it's it's. That's it, right? That's all you get. There's no modifications doable without writing code. So, and uh, Epitome is very, very easy to, to write with because it's, it's it's tiny. It's really a pre pretty small amount of code. So it's cross-platform architecture neutral. So I uh, borrowed some of the good stuff from the Sun folks. So we use XDRs everywhere. So people familiar with uh, NFS know what that means. Basically, all your data is saved in a... Uh, it's actually the precursor to XML. I'm allergic to XML, so... <laughs> I used something that didn't suck. And best of all, it is free, right? So the stuff that I was talking about from data domain, you really are paying tens of thousands of dollars for getting some of this functionality. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you pay attention to M time, or do you just hash the whole thing every time? Do I? Do you pay, pay attention to mod times, or do you just like yes. rehash everything? Uh, I rehash everything. Um, but I so I do save mod times eight times and all that good stuff. So, so that goes into the metadata. If you had like a really big, so what, how do you know that the clock is accurate? How do you know the changes happen twice? Well, you you can be conservative, right? I'm very conservative. I would hash it again. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, well, that may be a problem if you have a really large process. No, no, I, I don't. I, I see what you're saying, but um, this is not meant as a uh, if you will a traditional backup replacement, right? So this is really looking for duplicate data. And so I can play tricks on you and make that scheme fail every second, right? And that, that's part of the, the, I think that's actually one of the weaknesses of traditional backups, is that they are so easily circumvented. Yes, sir? Are you hashing every block in your store of the file system with periodicity, or are you hashing just every block in the file at modification time? Uh, whenever, so when, at this point, when you launch uh, Epitomize, which is a tool that generates the, uh, the metadata file, it will basically just, so you give it a directory name or a file name, and it will basically start at the beginning of the file, chunk the thing, and um, 
and like I said, in, in the protocol, what it does, it sends an exist to the server, to the backend first. Say, do you already have this hash? And it will only write uh, if it if it doesn't have it. So, and, uh, so the good thing about it is, is if you do that over network, then obviously you don't have the network transfer of the data. Right. Yes, sir. So, what's the current state of progress with the uh, 2.0? I mean, you said that you put together a few different. Mm -hmm. of the uh, network transfer on it. Um, is there any uh, alpha level use of code for that? No, it's 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 in my CVS tree. It's a mess. Uh, it's it's clearly it, it's throwaway code. So um, it's not useful. I, I did a lot of experiments. So one of the things that I wanted to prove was that it worked on multiple architectures. So that was a lot of work when just writing that portion of it. So that you can go with Spark 64 over the network to an AMD 64, something along those lines. So, but the code is, is at this point crap. So it was literally throwaway code. Yes, sir. So have you looked at doing replication of any data? So I was wondering where that question was. That was that was. <laughs> right. It seems to me if all of your data streams are basically predicated on getting back to the original copy mm -hmm. of what the data that the particular UUID represents, if that data is somehow not available, it would seem that all of your deltas moving forward since then are valid. So I'm not sure I understand what you just said. You, you store a chunk of data with particular, you get back a UID to represent that right. chunk, right? Mm -hmm. If that chunk somehow becomes unavailable... Why, why would I do that? Why? Yes, why would I do that? Minus a, an obvious hardware failure. Well, so you would obviously use, uh, I would use a RAID 6 underneath something like this, right, to have some uh, redundancy, because it is a worm. That's a way to look at it. So you write it. Uh, you're never going to delete that data again. Um, but if you lose it, you lose it, right, because it's deduced. Right? So you don't have a, a second copy either. So using things along like RAID is a good idea. Um, and um, so I, I didn't want to look too far in the future, but obviously you want to replicate the the store elsewhere as well, right? So that you have a, a secondary copy, but that that's that's way farther out. Uh, also, unless I unless I'm misunderstanding something, um, you're producing snapshots in time. If you only have one single copy and you lose a chunk somewhere, mm -hmm. you're not. It's not like deltas, like a like a, a sequence of diffs. It's individual chunks, so that it. Right. So that you only lost a chunk out of that one, you know, any versions that use that chunk. Uh, if you have another version that doesn't use that chunk, then that version is complete. That's right. So that's something of a mitigation. It's not a good one, no. <laughs> but yes. And, and there's one more complication. There's one corner case. Um, so if you're in the middle of the file, you know the block size, right? So you know what the data would actually chunk to. But if you're at the end of the file, you might have a variable-sized uh, chunk value. It could be one byte. So you could be missing one byte, but you wouldn't know if it's one byte or 16K if that's your, um, if, if that's your, your chunk size. But you should duplicate your dedupes data. You should. But uh, th there's ways around that, obviously, right? So a RAID 6, a, hardware, a good hardware RAID 6 would help you quite a bit here. Yes, sir? Um, and your, your minimized tool, is it? track of like the extended BSD file system flags and things to the metadata or? Yes, so uh, all the files are saved with the, um, so all, all the inode information is basically saved with it. Was that the right inode information? So the, the A dime, uh, M dime, like permissions. The, the no dump, and change flags, and extended. Yes, all, all that stuff gets, um, gets saved <coughs> off in the metadata. So just like with, uh, with TAR, right, you got to, uh, you got to tell the dash p that you want to uh, extract or put back all the, the same files as the way you got it. Yes, sir. In terms of uh, write ones uh, reading many, like if you're backing up a bunch of user data, people back up like MP3s or movies, and then you want to drop that, or you planning on adding any functionality so that people can drop sort of you know the the undeducable stuff that people leave behind, or so not currently. So the, the reason for that is, um, right now it's, it's a very easy scheme, right? Because if you're using raw disk, you just start, write, and then that's your new uh, marker where your disk is at. 
So if you want to do that on a raw disk, you cannot just go back somewhere and because you're going to have chunks that are missing. And you, know, you, you have to keep a whole lot more state. So it's better to throw away that piece of disk than it is to go try to fit, you know, a, a square peg in a round hole. Actually, I have a second question. Sure. Which is what if they're, you know, I see that the hash collisions are vanishingly small, you know, probability, but if one happens and it's in a binary file, you know, what, what's the what's the game there? So currently, the interruption. That's pretty simple, right? It kind of depends on who, who, what file it is, right? So one of them is going to be good, the other one's going to be bad. <laughs> so let's call it a 50 50 uh, chance of uh, any bad interruption. Yes, sir. Uh, are you looking at any, I don't even know if it's possible, hardware assisted hashing? Um, I didn't consider it, but I don't see why not. Right? If you, if you have a, um, a hardware shy engine, you could do that. Well, I mean, there's been plenty of people that have got really good experience with this current file system called ZFS, but they're already doing all of that crap anyway. Sure. So, so far, the people who have been rolling with like ZFSs haven't needed hardware assisted data hashing. Right, it's it's Sorry. it's really not that bad either, though. So I actually did um I did, did some performance measurements. I, I actually should have copied them in here. So, but you spend an order of magnitude more time compressing than you do uh, running the shot. And since the blocks are small, um, you've run ran over the data once already when you did the shot. So it's all in cache when you do the compression. So it's it really it's it's a virtually at no cost. Right. So you're storing sorry, you're storing, you're doing separate compression for each sixteen k block. Correct. So each of those can each of those compress each of those compressed files has its own compression dictionary. Yes. So it's, it just uses uh, glib. Uh, Zlib. Anything else? Yes, sir. You considered adding an encryption layer to the back end. Um, well, I thought about it, and no, because there's going to be better, smarter people that can do that. And what I mean by that is you can obviously just VPN your line, uh, and it would be. Encrypted to the store itself, not just yeah. So I, I consider that. I just um, that's just a lot of work. <laughs> Put it that way. And I live in the United States, so uh, I don't touch crypto for that reason. So if somebody uh, sends uh, wants to do diffs and wants to write a code, I'll I'll take it. That's not going to be me. Anybody else? Yes, sir. So you mentioned that you know, you're not doing anything. For you. you mentioned that you're not doing anything. For you. Yeah, 
about patterns in this? Yeah. So the reason why it is so simple is to actually stay away from the patterns. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it in the slide, but I actually put it in there. So the, the, the storage vendors are absolutely out of their minds at this point. They've been uh, basically patenting. Uh, if I add two numbers together, you get a new number, right? So the dust types of patterns are being submitted right now. It is, it is incredibly bad. So the reason why I picked it's such a simple algorithm is that obviously I'm not violating any, anyone's patents. And I think actually it, it is ex so simple, but, uh, but it does a pretty effective job. The, um, the incremental uh, backup, sorry, the, the incremental size length that you would have is, is minimal. So even though it, it, it looks very attractive to go spend a whole lot of time on it, I, I'm not convinced it's worth the effort. So um, knowing some of these vendors and the way, the way they do certain of these things, um, some of them run on, on two quad-core CPUs uh, with gigantic uh, disk stores behind it. To, to be able to deal with that kind of stuff, right? Because they want to do beacon detection. If they want to be the best you guy out, right? So they, and they're going for uh, compression. That, that's their end goal. And this is just to prevent a whole bunch of stuff going over the network. It's a slightly different model than what they do. Yes, sir. When you're in ROM mode, the back end, I guess, is being pointed at a physical device? Correct, disk. Can it only take one device as an option, or can you grow by adding more? Uh, so I haven't done that yet, but that's a trivial addition. So you basically would specify when you overflow uh, overflow to this device. So but look at it as, as, a, as a tape device, the, the disk. Because you literally just start at the, start at the beginning and you just keep on growing until it, it, it runs out. <coughs> Anything else? All right. Thank you.